So let me tell you a bit about the book and how I came to write it. The first question that usually comes up is something like this. How the heck did a married 46-year-old financial writer uh, for Fortune magazine, somebody who normally writes about oil and gas or the stock market, how the heck did I end up writing a book about dating? So here's the story. The staffs at Money and Fortune, my last two employers, were disproportionately women. The, over time, I couldn't help but notice that most of the men were married, like me, whereas most of the women were single, many of them unhappily single. And a lot of my female friends had these dating histories, these dating stories that just didn't make any sense to me. They would go out with guys who would never call them back, or they had boyfriends who cheated on them unapologetically, or some of them claimed never to get asked out on dates at all. And I have one friend from college, a woman who is literally the most attractive person I'm friends with, who can, uh, and she confided in me before, you know, as I was writing the book that she had not been asked out on a date in six months. So as I said, none of this made any sense to me. But at first, I figured this was some kind of a fluke unique to my own circle of friends. I think that the tipping point was a lunch I had with my friend Sarah. Sarah had been dating the same guy for a long time. And while Sarah and I are more work friends than personal friends, um, it certainly seemed like she and her boyfriend, Matt, were well on their way to getting married. So before our drinks arrived, I asked Sarah about Matt casually, and her expression basically crumpled. Uh, she sighed and told me that she and Matt had just broken up. Matt had informed her that he just wasn't quite ready to settle down. See, here's the thing. Matt, He's 45 years old. <laughs> he and Sarah had been dating for three years. Sarah was 38 years old at the time, and everyone knew that she wanted to get married and have kids. So for Matt to basically run out her clock to let the relationship drag on for almost three years without intending to marry Sarah, it just all seemed kind of cruel. Months later, I shared Sarah's story with Maria Avgatidis, who is a Manhattan matchmaker and dating coach. Maria told me she'd heard some version of this story so often that she'd come up with a moniker for the men. She calls them time thieves. And the key thing you need to know about my friend Sarah is that she literally has everything going for her. She's kind, she's funny, she's very good company. She's an Ivy Leaguer who looks like a cable news anchor. Uh, given the amount of time Sarah spends at the gym, I bet you anything she's more fit at 38 than she was at 28. Frankly, I just couldn't figure out why Sarah would have any difficulty convincing Matt that it was time to get married. So, so that's basically how I came up with the idea for the book. I wanted to find out why, it was, why dating was so difficult for women like Sarah, and also why men like Matt seemed to have so many options. Now, I must admit that my theory going into all this was different from where I ended up. Initially, I assumed that this shortage of college-educated men was a phenomenon unique to a handful of big cities like Washington or New York or London or Toronto or LA. I figured there was something about the job markets in these very cosmopolitan cities that attracted disproportionate numbers of women. Well, it turned out that the problem that I call the man deficit is not a big city problem. It's not, or not just a big city problem. It's a, nation, it's a nationwide problem. In the US, there are now 5.5 million college educated women who are aged 22 to 29 versus 4.1 million college-educated men in the same age bracket. Now, pause for a moment and let those, I think you're already pausing for, <laughs> let those numbers sink in. According to the US Census Bureau's American Community Survey, among college grads in their 20s, there are now 5.5 million women versus 4.1 million men. That's 33% more women than men, that's four women for every three men. And what I found most interesting about the dating math is it's actually worse in rural states. Montana has 52% more college grad women than men among millennials. In Arkansas, it's 49% more female college grads. That compares to 34% more women than men in Washington, DC among young college grads, 30% in New York State, and 20% in California. As daunting as this four to three ratio may be for women, the actual dating math is even worse. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, mathematically, dating is a bit like, like the game Musical Chairs. Um, and if you ever played Musical Chairs as a kid, you probably recall that in the very first round of Musical Chairs, it's almost impossible to lose. Basically, you have to be eating paste or chasing butterflies <laughs> not to get a chair, right? Uh, it, but by the last round of Musical Chairs, you have a 50% chance of not getting a chair. The longer you stay in the game, the greater your chances are of losing. And in this way, the dating game is similar. So just imagine a dating pool that starts out with 40 women and 30 men, which is essentially what, what's confronting millennials these days. Once half of those women get married, once half of the 40 women get married, the dating pool for the remaining singles becomes 20 women and 10 men. In other words, the ratio of, of, of women to men goes from 1.3 to 1 at the start of the dating game to 2 to 1 at the midway point. So that, in a nutshell, is why dating feels so much harder for women at 33 than it did at 23. It's not that you're returning his text message an hour too soon or an hour too late. <laughs> this, is a this is a demographic problem. It is not a strategic problem. Now, just to be completely clear, my message is not that women have to get married at 23, or even that anybody has to get married at all. Personally, I don't care whether people prioritize family over career or career over family. My intention is certainly not to scare young women into believing that they can't have it all, that they can't have a career or a fun personal life without jeopardizing some future hope of marital bliss. My goal is merely to help people make informed life decisions. So if you're a heterosexual woman who puts a high priority on marriage, and I acknowledge that is not everyone, but if that's you, you should be aware that the marriage math will be more challenging should you decide to put off getting serious about dating until your early 30s. Now, one of my arguments in datanomics is that the college and post-college hookup culture is largely a byproduct of these lopsided gender ratios. The counter argument I hear most often from skeptics involves the influence of popular culture or the media. In other words, couldn't it just be that times have changed? Couldn't it be that movies and television and sexually explicit lyrics are what's really behind young people having more sex? Look, I'm, I'm not so naive as to believe that pop culture and the media exert zero influence over our behavior. Those of us like me with teenagers uh, are well aware of how actors and athletes and pop stars can influence the way that our kids talk or dress or even think. The problem I have with blaming the media for the hookup culture is based purely on the data. While college kids may be having more sex than ever, it turns out that high school students are having less sex these days, not more. According to the US Centers for Disease Control, the percentage of teenagers who are sexually active today is lower than it was in 1988, which was the height of the AIDS crisis. So if Hollywood really is trying to promote promiscuity, let's just say Hollywood is doing a terrible job. Now, of course, lopsided gender ratios among college graduates would not matter so much if we were all a bit more open-minded about whom we date and eventually marry. There have been multiple studies on this subject, most recently by Jeremy Greenwood, who's an economist at the University of Pennsylvania. And what studies like his have found is a steady decrease in what I call educational intermarriage. In other words, the chances of someone with a college degree marrying somebody without a college degree, those chances are lower today than at any point over the past 50 years. My personal suspicion is that online dating makes this worse. Online dating is a bit like choosing options on a new car. You check off various boxes for your ideal mate, height, weight, race, dog person, cat person, oceans, lake, that kind of thing. For the children of the suburbs, nobody ever thinks twice about checking off that box for college graduate. As a result, few college grads ever even see the dating profiles of single people who lack a college degree. A few weeks ago, I actually got a Twitter message from a woman who told me she met her husband after she unchecked the college education box on her online dating site. Now, it's not fair, 
but for men refusing to consider call, I'm sorry, for, for men refusing to consider working class women doesn't really cost them anything. The pool of college educated women is just so vast that men pay no real penalty for refusing to, to date somewhat, someone who is less educated than they are. For college educated women, however, not expanding their dating pool to include working class guys carries a high price. Not only are they making it statistically more challenging to find a match, but in doing so, women are giving way too much leverage to college educated men. Those men know they are in high demand, and a lot of them act accordingly. Over the years, sociologists, psychologists, and economists have done a lot of research on sex ratios and their impact. The findings are really consistent. When men are the ones in oversupply, or women in undersupply, depending on your perspective, the dating culture is more likely to emphasize courtship and monogamy and romance. The dating culture is more traditional. Men must make a long-term commitment in order to attract a wife, and thus men actually have an evolutionary incentive to be good husbands and fathers. As a result, monogamy is embraced and divorce is less common. When it comes to studying sex ratios, college campuses are perfect case studies because colleges operate as self-contained dating pools. In other words, students tend to date other students. And while the average college campus these days is 57% female, that's four women for every three men, there are, of course, still colleges out there that have more men than women. One of them is California Institute of Technology, better known as Caltech, in Pasadena, California. Caltech is 59% male, which is essentially three women for every two men. I paid a visit to Caltech while researching my book. With the help of the editor of Caltech student newspaper, I arranged a focus group with a dozen Caltech students. Here's what I learned. At Caltech, hookups aren't even part of the dating vernacular. As one woman told me, the guys are never going to get into a situation where they're hooking up every night because the girls just won't go for it. When Caltech students get involved romantically, it's almost always in the context of a relationship. Students told me it was extremely common for couples who got together freshman year to stay together all four years. One, one, one young woman told me that when she was a freshman, um, an advisor in her freshman dorm urged her not to rush into her first college relationship. She told me, you'll probably end up marrying the guy. <laughs> On a lark, I asked the Caltech students what Valentine's Day was like there. The answer I got was kind of equally adorable and flabbergasting. One young man told me with tremendous enthusiasm that his dorm, Lloyd House, has a long-standing Valentine's Day tradition. It turns out all the men make handcrafted Valentines for the women. <laughs> and then they wake up at the crack of dawn to cook the women pancakes. What stories like these so clearly demonstrate is that dating culture truly is more monogamous when women are scarce. After college, one place where you really see this play out is in Silicon Valley, uh, which is basically the only well-populated part of the country where young college grad men outnumber young college grad women by a significant margin. Geographically, Santa Clara County, California, is a pretty good proxy for Silicon Valley. The county seat, San Jose, is often referred to as Man Jose by the locals, <laughs> and with really good reason. Among single college-educated people, 22 to 29, Santa Clara County has 38% more single men than women. And this oversupply of men affects dating and marriage in really predictable ways. Among college grads in their 30s, 78% of the women in Santa Clara County are married. That compares to 48% in Washington, D.C., 58% in Chicago, and 46% in Boston. What's even more interesting is those marriages in Silicon Valley, they're more stable too. Only 4% of Santa Clara County's college grad women aged 30 to 39 are divorced or separated, 4%. Nationally, it's 9%. Men must also make a greater financial commitment when women are scarce. There's an economics professor at MIT, a guy named Joshua Angrist, 
who studied immigrant communities in the late 1800s and early 1900s, back when immigrants to the US were disproportionately men. What Angris found was that men needed to earn more in order to attract a wife. The married men earned 10% more than the men who were unmarried. This is just as true today. If there is an undersupply of men in the college-educated dating pool, that obviously means there's an oversupply in the non-college or working class dating pool. In fact, among Americans aged 22 to 29 who did not have a college degree, there are now 9.4 million single men versus only 7.1 million single women. This woman deficit, so to speak, within the working class plays out exactly how Professor Angrist's research suggests it should. Among non-college men aged 25 to 30 who are fully employed, the ones who are married earn 20% more than the ones who are unmarried. Circling back to Silicon Valley, the reason Santa Clara County has more men, obviously, is because the high-tech industry employs so many engineers and programmers, professions that, for better or for worse, tend to attract more men. Santa Clara County also happens to boast the highest median income of any county in the United States. Now, I'm not going to suggest that median incomes out there would be merely average were it not for the shortage of women. However, I do believe that wealth creation in Silicon Valley has been supercharged by this shortage of women. Listen to what Tom Summit, a tech industry executive recruiter in Boston, listen to the advice that Tom Summit gives to men employed in Boston's high tech sector. Quote, countless venture capitalists, pundits, and most anybody else involved in the Silicon Valley startup scene will ask you, when are you moving out here? This is where it's happening. They want you, they need you, and they will own your butt. Because what they don't tell you is that you will have nothing else to occupy your attention and keeping you from working 80 hours a week, cranking code with your nose in the computer screen. Why? Because there are no women to distract you from your tasks. Another place where you really clearly see the economic impact of too few women is China. As most of you probably know, China's old one-child policy caused an increase in sex, selec sex selection, abortion, female infanticide, and the foreign adoption of many Chinese girls. All of this present day has created a shortage of marriage age women. There are now 122 young men in China for every 100 young women. As a result, Chinese women now possess tremendous economic bargaining power when it comes to marriage. That means young men and the parents of boys must accumulate greater wealth in order to impress a potential bride. Two economists, Shang Jinwei, who's a professor at Columbia University, and Jiabo Chang, who's a senior economist at the International Food Policy Research Institute here in Washington, they have gone so far as to suggest that this pressure on men and on parents of boys to earn more is responsible for 20% of China's GDP growth. It's gotten to the point where a middle-class bachelor must own his own apartment and a new car in order to be considered husband material in China. A story in the LA Times contained this quote from one Chinese bachelorette. I would rather cry in a BMW than smile on the back of my boyfriend's bicycle. <laughs> a more recent story from Bloomberg News contained this even more amazing comment from a young Chinese husband expecting his first child. I would hope it's a girl, he said, because boys are too expensive. Now, that is an unbelievable statement when you consider the way Chinese culture has glorified boy babies going back almost a thousand years. Okay, so now we know what happens when women are scarce. Let's look at what happens when men are scarce, which is the current situation today among college students and college grad millennials. Sociologists and psychologists who study sex ratios have found that when sex ratios skew female, the whole dating culture becomes more sexualized. The good news, according to clinical sex surveys, is that everyone seems to have better sex. And yes, this apparently applies to married folks too. Uh, clinical sex studies show that when gender ratios skew female, couples engage in more foreplay, more experimentation, and have more frequent intercourse. 
The bad news for single women is that the single men are in no rush to settle down. Marriage rates decline, divorce rates go up, and out of wedlock births become more commonplace. As I said before, one of my core arguments is that today's hookup culture is largely a byproduct of gender ratios, and not Tinder, not MTV, or any of the other explanations that some people glom onto. I know that that Vanity Fair story on Tinder generated a lot of buzz, but my take was that, it was that story was just unbelievably naive. Tinder is less than four years old. The hookup culture was alive and well long before Tinder arrived. There's actually a rather long and ridiculous history of folks mistakenly blaming the latest, two te the latest new technology for a rise in sexual permissiveness. In the 1920s, for example, people blamed the automobile for the rise of the flapper generation. A house of prostitution on wheels is how one state court judge <laughs> described it. The real explanation for the loosening of sexual mores had nothing to do with the automobile. Some 10 million young men died during World War I. Another 20 million were injured, many of them grievously. This created an incredibly lopsided dating market after World War I ended. I don't know if any of you have read Irene Nemirovsky's novel, The Fires of Autumn. Nemirovsky came of age in 1920s France. And The Fires of Autumn reflects the social sensibilities of that era. In her novel, a young war widow named Therese thinks she is being courted for marriage by her childhood friend Bernard, only to discover that he wants nothing more than a fling. Bernard, in turn, is baffled by Therese's unwillingness to carry on a casual affair. Given the shortage of young men in post-World War I Europe, Bernard cannot understand why any bachelor would want to settle down. You want to have some fun, he asked Therese rhetorically. Fine, you don't, goodbye. There are too many women, and they're all too easy to make it worthwhile. Spend some time on college campuses, as I have, and you'll find a lot of men who sound an awful lot like Bernard. Women at disproportionately female schools talk openly about their frustrations. Everyone's self-esteem takes a hit, a young woman at 75% female Sarah Lawrence College told me. This young woman complained to me that the men of Sarah Lawrence have little interest in exclusive relationships. Why would they, she told me. It's like they have their own free harem. She continued, one of my friends was dumped by a guy after they'd been hooking up for less than a week. When he broke up with her, the guy actually used the word market, like the market for him was just too good. A male Sarah Lawrence student I interviewed shared a similar assessment, although he wasn't really bemoaning uh, Sarah Lawrence's hookup culture, he was essentially celebrating it. He told me, there really isn't a culture of monogamy or even dating here. Sometimes it feels like you can have anyone you want. Now, to be clear, this guy was no Tom Brady. I mean, he, he kind of looked like John Lennon circa 1970, except even more malnourished. Yet his, his stories were just so, shall we say, colorful, that at one point I blurted out and I just had to ask him how many of his current female friends he'd had sex with, just his current ones. Oh, I'd say at least 20, he told me. Yeah, that was my reaction too, and he saw that and he added a little qualifier just to take the edge off it. He told me, you should know that includes some threesomes and foursomes. The gender ratio at Sarah Lawrence is particularly extreme. It's three women for every one man. But in terms of the dating culture, it's not as much of an outlier as you'd think. In the appendix of Datanomics, I include a table that ranks 35 major public and private colleges by their gender ratios, and then pairs that data with students' own description of dating life at their schools. The descriptions are courtesy of Niche.com, which is a college review website that's authored entirely by students. So here's what Niche had to say about some schools that are 60% or more women. At 50% female Boston University, quote, freshman year is a sexual explosion. There are girls to go around and around again. At 61% female New York University, quote, guys take advantage of the male to female ratio and most have no plans of settling into a long-term relationship. 
closer to Washington, 63% female James Madison University. Quote, the deficiency of guys creates a scene that tends to embrace random hookups. Even at Baylor University, a Baptist school steeped in Christian values, Baylor's ratio of three women for every two men still has a big impact. According to Niche.com's write-up of dating at Baylor, quote, the same girls that run in the social hookup circles on Friday night are taking you to church with them on Sunday. The guys practice the requisite Christian business principles, but blow through the Baylor babes that are an endless supply. Another 6040 college is UNC Chapel Hill. A few years ago, the New York Times wrote a story about the shortage of men at University of North Carolina. The story contained this quote from a female UNC undergrad. Quote, a lot of my friends will meet someone and go home for the night and just hope for the best the next day. They'll text them and say, I had a great time, want to hang out next week, and they don't respond. Even worse, girls feel pressured to do more than they're comfortable with just to lock it down. By comparison, the college dating scene is much more traditional at schools that are either majority male or at least have gender ratios closer to 50-50. I already told you about Caltech. Here's what Niche.com has to say about Georgia Tech, which is 66% male. Tech is a fairly monogamous campus, and people like to be in a relationship. How about Tufts University, which is 50-50 thanks to a big engineering program? According to Niche.com, at Tufts, quote, halfway through sophomore year, people begin to pair off and generally stay paired off through junior and senior year. Or consider University of Miami. Yes, it's a notorious party school, but it's one that's only 53% female. Remember, the average is 57%. According to Niche, quote, random hookups are common in the beginning, but after a few months or a year, relationships take over. It isn't just the dating culture that changes when women are in oversupply. Sex ratios can have economic and even political impacts, too. Just as men earn more when women are scarce, women become more career-minded when, when it's the men who are scarce. Christina Durante, who's a marketing professor at Rutgers Business School, Durante conducted a series of psychological experiments in which young single women were presented with information that caused them to believe that their local dating market either had too few men or too many men. The study participants were asked which was more important to them. After, after the initial stage, they were asked which is more important to them, career or family. Durante found that the women who thought that there were too many men were more likely to prioritize family, whereas the women who thought there were too many women were more likely to prioritize career. Durante concluded that sex ratios, quote, lead women to seek more lucrative careers when it will be more difficult to secure a mate. As I said, there can be a political impact, too. The pioneering book on sex ratios, titled Too Many Women, was the brainchild of the late Marsha Gutentag, a psychology professor at Harvard University who died prematurely at age 44 in 1977. She died before she finished the book, but Too Many Women was completed and co-authored by Paul Secord, Gutentag's second husband and a fellow academic. As counterintuitive as it may sound, Gutentag and Secord conclude that feminist movements are energized when men are in short supply. Here's what they wrote. What we are suggesting in answer to the sex ratio question is that given the abundance of unattached women, men will shape to their advantage the form that, that relationships between men and women take. With a surplus of women, sexual freedoms are more advantageous to, to men than to women. These circumstances should impel women to seek more power and incidentally turn them towards meeting their own needs. Most forms of feminism are directed to just such ends. On college campuses, the surge in feminist activity has been fueled by growing concerns about sexual assault. I believe these concerns are very real, but I also believe that lopsided gender ratios are part of the problem. Another one of Marsha Gutentag's counterintuitive sounding findings in Too Many Women was that throughout history, 
When ratios of women to men were high, rape was more prevalent and it was also punished less severely. More recently, sociologists and criminologists have studied FBI and Interpol crime data and reached the same conclusion. In the words of University of Oregon sociologist Robert O'Brien, elevated rates of sexual assault, quote, are a predictable feature of countries with a relative scarcity of men. The opposite is true of countries with a relative scarcity of women. Columbia University economics professor Lena Edlund investigated the impact of lopsided sex ratios in China, where young men now outnumber women by 20%. Edlund and her co-authors discovered that although overall crime rates went up in China as the gender ratio skewed more male, that's not surprising given that men are more prone to criminality, there was a significant decline in sexual assault. It seems that men treat women better and protect them more when women are in shorter supply. Now, can I, pr can I prove beyond all doubt that such findings apply to college campuses? that sexual assault is less common at schools that are at least 50% male? No, I cannot, because the available, the available data tends to reveal as much about how forthright colleges are in handling sexual assaults and how comfortable women feel coming forward as it does about the actual frequency of assaults on a particular campus. That said, I was intrigued by a recent Washington Post story on this topic. The article ranked 27 colleges by their sexual assault rates, and I could not help but notice which college had the lowest rate. It was Caltech, a school that is 59% male. So thank you all for listening, and I look forward to taking questions. <laughs>